This is audible. It's only a movie, a cinematic autobiography inspired by real events, written and read by Mark Kermode. Prologue. We were somewhere near Lookout Mountain on the outskirts of L.A. when Werner Herzog's trousers exploded. It was a small explosion, admittedly, as if a firecracker had gone off in his pocket, but it was an explosion nonetheless, and in an area where unexpected bangs are to be treated with suspicion, if not outright alarm. Herzog had been shot; that much was clear, and was even now bleeding quietly into his boxer shorts. As a tiny plume of smoke drifted photogenically from his pelvic region and into the evening air of L.A., and as we stood there, the bold Bavarian with a bullet in his groin and the befuddled British film critic with ridiculous hair from Barnet, I wondered exactly the same thing that anyone else would have wondered in similar circumstances. If this were a TV movie of the week, who would play me? I'd like the answer to be Richard Gere, although physically the front runner is clearly Jesse Birdsell, on whose behalf I've been merrily accepting compliments about my sterling work in that Spanish soap series for years. Apparently, Birdsell and I are all but physically indistinguishable to the public at large, and I've simply given up trying to tell people that I'm not him. I've even signed autographs with best wishes from Jesse to those who won't take no for an answer. Sometimes I wonder whether this is a two-way street. And whether Mr. Birdsell has ever been thumped for writing a rotten review of Blue Velvet, or punched on the arm for dubbing Kira Knightley IKEA Knightley in honour of her on-screen tikiness, if so, I apologise. And Jesse, if you're listening to this, everyone really loved you in El Dorado, and there's a genuine sense of outrage out there that the series was cancelled. Believe me, I know. I've experienced the love firsthand. But looks aren't everything. Did Sir Anthony Hopkins look anything like Nixon? Was Kevin Spacey a dead ringer for Bobby Darren? And since we're in the realms of fantasy here, I think I should get to choose whoever I like to play me, and I choose Jason Isaacs. Hello to Jason Isaacs. In case you don't know, in which case shame on you, Jason Isaacs is just about my favourite actor in the whole gosh darn world. He's done everything from gritty TV dramas to rom-coms, war flicks, fantasy films, and sci-fi blockbusters. To some of you, he'll be best known as the fiendish Lucius Malfoy from the Harry Potter films. But to me, he is, in the words of David Bowie, chameleon, comedian, Corinthian, and caricature. More importantly, he's also the person whom I most wanted to be as a child. You see. Jason and I were at school together in the same class, although we never really spoke or even acknowledged each other's existence. I thought he was incredibly cool and aloof, being one of the first people at school to own a skateboard, a Fiberflex with gullwing trucks and lime green Kryptonic wheels, and the very first to swear out loud in an English class, "Who made the bloody sandwiches?" But it turns out that the real reason Jason never spoke to anyone was that he was just like me, isolated and alone. Insecure and essentially out of place, albeit infinitely more handsome. If truth be told, I think I had a sort of schoolboy crush on Jason Isaacs, and I've never really got over it. And if I get to choose who plays me in the movie of my life, then it's Jason all the way. He knows the background, he's done the research, and he'd look really good with a quiff. So the lead role in the Mark Kermode story. Well, we need to come up with a better title. Easy Writer, perhaps, or the man who watched the man who shot Liberty Valance, goes to Jason with John Malkovich co-starring as Werner Herzog, same shaped head and hair, and I'm pretty sure John Malkovich could do Bavarian. Then, in the other assorted sporting roles, I'll have Toby Jones as David Lynch. I've heard his impression, and it really is quite unusual. Samantha Morton as Linda Blair because she's tough and smart and great in pretty much everything. And David Morrissey is Noddy Holder. He's got stature. Plus, he had good sideburns in Stone. Plus, plus, he was really funny in Basic Instinct too, for which I retain a foolish fondness. The role of my long-suffering partner in crime, Linda Ruth Williams, will be filled by four-time Academy Award nominee Julianne Moore, who will have to work pretty damn hard to look unimpressed by all the zany scrapes into which Mr. Isaacs will get himself. The Queen will play Dame Helen Mirren, obviously. Charles Hawtrey will play radio's very own Simon Mayo, his choice, not mine. Ian Hislop will play my great friend Nigel Floyd, not physically similar, but a perfect match in attitude and mannerisms. 
and Ken Russell will play himself. I've already asked him, and he's said yes, as long as it's only in my head. Finally, Udo Kier will essay the key role of mad Ukrainian chauffeur Mr. Niet, having been cast entirely on the strength of that scene in Flesh for Frankenstein, wherein he pulls the pulsating innards from a cadaver's chest, holds them out towards the audience in 3D, and utters my favourite line from a movie ever, To no death, Otto, you have to fuck life in the gallbladder. Well, that's my dream cast. I know it sounds starry. Getting her madge involved might prove tricky, particularly as I'm a declared Republican. But these days, everyone's doing TV movies of the week. They've become completely respectable, as has the phrase with which they invariably open, inspired by real events. I love that phrase, inspired by real events. As opposed to what, exactly? Uninspired by real events? Or inspired by unreal events? Both seem equally applicable in my case, and both are on a philosophical par with Woody Allen's timeless maxim that life doesn't imitate art, it imitates bad television. A key piece of bad television which hangs like a cloud over this memoir is the Karen Carpenter story, a spectacular piece of reductionist hackery in which the heroine's dawning anorexia is flagged up by a creeping close-up on leading lady Cynthia Gibbs' face, as she reads a review in Billboard magazine containing the phrase, Chubby Sister. One evening, several years ago, I found myself in a West End pub with journalist and writer John Ronson, and after several pints of the old Johnny knock-me-down, our conversation turned to that wince-inducing moment in the Karen Carpenter story. Crucially, John had slightly misremembered that scene. Another key element of this book will be misremembered movies. And in his mind, Cynthia, stroke Karen had looked up from the paper and said perplexedly to herself, Chubby? Hmm. In the drunken haze that followed, John and I agreed to make a TV programme entitled Chubby? Hmm. Which would bring together all those terrible moments in real-life movies in which the famous subjects are seen doing for the first time the thing for which they would ultimately become famous. Scenes like Carl McLachlan pretending to dream up the keyboard line from Light My Fire in Oliver Stone's The Doors, tagline, no one here gets out awake. Or that bit in the Buddy Holly story where the boys realise that if you knew Cindy Lou didn't sound quite right. John and I never made the programme, but the phrase chubby, hmm, has stayed with me ever since and has become shorthand for all that is deeply rubbish about stories which purport to be inspired by real events. This book, which has about as much relationship to the truth as the Karen Carpenter story, is packed with chubby hmm moments and I invite you now to shake your head, roll your eyes, and bang your fists against your head in horror whenever they arise. But arise they will, because that's the nature of the beast. And if it was good enough for Karen Carpenter and Buddy Holly, then frankly, it's good enough for me. What you're going to get here, then, is a version of my life which has been written and directed by me, and on which I have acted as editor, cinematographer, consultant, composer, and executive producer. The last few titles in that list are particularly important because they're the roles with which Richard Carpenter was credited on the Karen Carpenter story, but that still didn't stop him from reportedly disowning the movie several years later, claiming that several key scenes were bunkum and declaring that he regretted being involved with the whole venture in the first place. I may well do the same thing, not because what I'm about to tell you is a bunch of lies, although it may be just that, but because my version of reality has been so skewed by the conventions of narrative cinema that I'm honestly unable to tell which part of any particular story I am telling is true and which part is expedient invention cooked up to get the damn movie to work. In the vernacular of screenwriters, my life story is absolutely full of pink pages and it's impossible to tell the original script from all the rewrites and reshoots. It doesn't help that I also have a shockingly bad memory am given to exaggeration, if not outright fabrication, and generally regard almost everything as only a movie. You know that scene in the docudrama United 93, when someone has to explain to air traffic control that the inconceivable scenario unfolding before them is happening in the real world, rather than in some parallel fantasy universe? Well, that's how I feel most of the time. Worse still, I have a tin ear for dialogue, I've often criticised Quentin Tarantino for being utterly unable to get inside the head of any character other than himself, 
with the result that everyone in a Tarantino film speaks like Quentin bloody Tarantino. Doesn't matter whether they're old, young, male or female, black or white, human or alien, all his characters sound like that nerdy guy from the independent video store down the street whose insights are entertaining for the first few weeks, but whose persistent yabbering finally sends you scurrying off to the anonymous ignorance of Blockbuster. The sole exception to this rule is Jackie Brown, the one Tarantino movie which is based on a literary source, Elmore Leonard's Rum Punch, whose writer seems to have listened to voices other than his own and who thinks that a woman is more than just a guy without a dick. Significantly, Jackie Brown was a comparative box office flop, and its financial failure sent Quentin scurrying back to the infantile fanboy claptrap of Kill Bill and its ilk. More's the pity. Like all critics, however, I habitually slag others off for failing to do things which I clearly could not do myself. In the case of Quentin's solipsistic dialogue, I'm a worse offender than he has ever been, and you'll notice that everyone in this book not only talks like me, but, more often than not, like someone doing a very bad impression of me. I apologise for this in advance, particularly if you are one of the real people into whose fictional mouths I have placed my second-rate B-movie dialogue. Please be assured that if it were in my power to make you sound more like you, I would have done so. But it isn't. And I can't. So I haven't. Sorry. And while we're in self-deprecating mode, let me take this opportunity to make it quite clear to any filmmaker whose work I've criticised that no, I couldn't make a film not even if my life depended on it. To twist the words of F. Scott Fitzgerald, something else I do quite a lot of in this book, filmmakers are different from you and me, and let's be honest, they do something that you or I could never dream of doing. Despite my reputation for lambasting movies with a passion which borders upon psychosis, I remain genuinely stunned that anyone can ever get a film, any film, made at all. I've been on movie sets where I've witnessed the corpulent chaos of filmmaking firsthand, and the sheer logistics of making sure everything doesn't go belly up on day one are mind-boggling. Someone once said that a movie in production is like a ship teetering on the brink of mutiny, and once the ship has set sail... The director's job is not to conjure a groundbreaking work of art, but simply to bring the whole thing safely into dock without the loss of A, lives, and B, more importantly, money. I remember novelist-turned-director Clive Barker describing his first day filming the ripping British horror movie Hellraiser, walking out onto the set to find everyone waiting for instructions on how to proceed. OK, said Clive to the assembled masses, so what do we do now? at which point he realised that he was the only person in the room who was not allowed to ask that question. And it's not just Barker who's encountered such moments. Apparently Orson Welles' first day directing Citizen Kane was a disaster because the stage and radio graduates simply had no idea about the rules of movie making. According to popular mythology, after a morning of fudging and fumbling, Welles was taken aside by battle-hardened cinematographer Greg Tolland who offered to explain to him how movie-making worked. This he did by showing him a print of John Ford's die-hard western stagecoach, which he used to demonstrate such elementary principles as not crossing the line, the cavalry are attacking from the left, therefore the Indians enter from the right, and so on. The next day, Wells went back to work on the film that would effectively redefine the semantics of modern movie grammar, breaking rules as he saw fit, as indeed had Ford, to create what some consider to be the greatest movie ever made. But in order to break those rules, he first had to learn them, which he did with preternatural dexterity. If Tolland had explained those rules to you or me, and we had attempted to break them, we would have made Howard the Duck. Like I said, filmmakers are not like you and me, unless you are a filmmaker, in which case they are, obviously. So, to recap, what you're about to get is, in effect, the literary equivalent of the Karen Carpenter story, as written by Quentin Tarantino's thick-eared sibling, and directed by a film critic who, by his own admission, wouldn't know how to direct traffic. It is inspired by real events, and therefore essentially untrue from start to finish. It is also exactly...